Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back. Happy holidays to everybody celebrating uh, this week. Um, today we'll talk about something GI related because Rachel's here, so obviously it's going to be <laughs> GI related. Uh, so talk to us. So we have a 72 year old male. He has past medical history of hypertension, diabetes. He presents to the ER with abdominal pain for two to three days and chills at home. Mm -hmm. Denies any fevers, any nausea, any vomiting, any change in appetite, any change in bowel movements. Describes the pain as a dull ache in the left lower quadrant, non-radiating, not pulsating, not sharp, didn't change at all. It's been the same dull pain in the left lower quadrant. Um, so here in our ER, he was hemodynamically stable. Mm -hmm. His AFAB bile, his vital signs are completely stable. Uh, so first physical exam, you know, most of everything is normal. In the abdomen, the area that we're concerned about, He's soft, non distended, tender in the left lower quadrant. And he's a negative McBurney, he's a negative Murphy, he's a negative psoas operator just because sometimes the appendix can be longer yeah. and go into the left lower quadrant. So yeah, just, we talked about that in our appendicitis uh, video. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I like to just rule out everything mm -hmm. just in case. Um, so, you know, the next step is just to get labs. Most of his labs were normal. The mm -hmm. only outstanding outlier was his white cells on his CBC. Okay. His white count was 13.3, so right. elevated. Mm -hmm. um, everything else was entirely stable. Do you order like amylase lipase for this situation? I know it's not epigastric pain, yeah. it's lower, left lower quadrant, but I, I feel like whenever I see a, whenever I see a GI consults, they order everything. Instead of just like specific to the area, and I think it's just like being defensive medicine. Mm -hmm. But did you guys order amylase lipase? So the, these patients, by the time we get to them, already have an entire. Oh, because it's the emergency room because, doing all this stuff, yeah. right? Okay. So the ER sends labs, the ER sends for imaging. Um, by the time we see them, we pretty much have a diagnosis made from the facts that we have even okay. before we can get to see the patient. Right. Uh, which is not what you should do. But practically, I think that's just what happens. Yeah. So the ER, yeah, I did get a lipase amylase, and I think you're right. I think it is defensive medicine. Mm -hmm. Just God forbid you didn't get it, and all of a sudden his lipase was like 3,000. Right, right. And you're not treating it. So you got the imaging? Yeah. So the imaging was a CT. Mm -hmm. It showed acute findings compatible with diverticulitis and the descending in yeah. sigmoid colon. That's right. I mean, a 72-year-old with left lower quadrant pain. Yeah. Um, an elevated white count and that's it. You're, you're, I think that's the most common thing that's going to be there. So diverticulitis makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Well, because it's his first episode ever of diverticulitis, you can get by with treating it with antibiotics. Actually, the standard treatment for the first episode is with antibiotics. Okay. So we admitted him to just watch his white count go down. I think he only stayed for maybe 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, so in-house, he was given ceftriaxone, metronidazole. He went home on cefpidoxime and mm -hmm. metronidazole. You just want to cover all the GI flora. Yep. You have a course for 10 to 14 days, and you're kind of treated from your acute bout of diverticulitis. And if it's diverticulitis, what kind of diet do you want to put them on? On a low-fiber diet. Yeah. And it's diverticulosis, you want to put them on a high-fiber diet, yeah. right? Okay. So talk to us about diverticulitis. So it can occur anywhere along your colon. It's most commonly in your sigmoid colon. Mm -hmm. If you do have sequel diverticulum, it's more likely caused by congenital diverticulum. Okay. Cool, right? Yeah. So what happens is you have increased intraluminal pressure. So whether that be because you're constipated or whether you have impaction from fecal matter or what have you. It causes mucosal outpouching between the tinea where they enter the vasa recta and the mesentery. Okay. So that's how you form a diverticulum. Okay. And all it is is, is me doing this. <laughs> all it is is this yeah. shape um, going to your colon, and it has this very small little um, entrance point. And it can very easily get blocked by something like flax seeds or poppy seeds or... They also say nuts, um, right? Because they all get caught and you don't want to exactly. get that caught within the diverticulum because it causes an infection afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, so 
treatment is where people start to kind of butt heads. Um, just antibiotics or surgery. Right. Right. So there's this good thing called the Hinchy classification that stages diverticulitis in four stages and that can help guide you between conservative management or surgery. Mm-hmm. But the more common umbrella rule is if you have more than three episodes of diverticulitis, then you're warranted for a stigmoid resection. And so you come in electively when your episode of diverticulitis is completely resolved, there's no inflammation around there. You'll come in, get your sigmoid resected with a primary anastomosis and continue on with your life and have a very decreased chance of ever having another bout of diverticulitis or another bout of diverticulum forming. Okay. All All right. right. So why antibiotics for this patient that you told us about? It was his first ever episode. And what if this happened the second time? He can still get by on antibiotics. We would urge him to consider surgery, but not in a way where he's putting himself in harm if he denies it. So a relative indication. Mm -hmm. What are absolute indications for surgery? If you're hemodynamically unstable, if the diverticula has completely perforated, causing free air. Yep. If the patient is peritonitic on exam, then there's really no point in even getting If the patient looks toxic, essentially, right? Exactly. That's the only indication where when the patient comes in with active diverticulitis, would you take them to the operator? Got it, got it. With that being said, it's only because of the amount of inflammation around or the chance of infection that anastomosis is no longer healing. There's more like a more, there's a higher chance of them needing an, a temporary ostomy. Whereas just about with anything else, whether it's a micro perforation, an abscess formation, or just a nasty bout of diverticulitis, you can get by with IV antibiotics, an IR drain to drain the abscess, anything to kind of calm down, cool down the infection, cool down the inflammation, and then come in and electively have that affected colon, affected, affected colon removed. Yeah. Okay. I, I've noticed a pattern now with all these GI pathologies where if you have an inflammation, you know, always in school we've been taught that if they have an inflammation, they have to go to the OR. Um, but it seems like the trend now is whenever they come in with infection, your job is to bring down, bring down that infection with antibiotics mm-hmm. and then come back for elective surgery yeah. as opposed to what used to be the trend is uh, when you come into the ER with diverticulitis, appendicitis, cholecystitis, and you go straight to the OR. Um, but that's not the trend anymore, right? Like. So even in surgery, where we make money from the OR, surgery, yeah. um, you want to try to avoid surgery if possible. Um, it seems like very bread and butter, especially if you work in surgery, where it's like, okay, relax, you had a laparoscopic colon resection, it's fine. Um, it's a trauma to the body. Anesthesia is difficult to recover from. Patients don't really return to baseline as quick as possible. It's a life-changing major event. Yeah, absolutely. And you have multiple complications, pre-op, post-op, intra-op, a lot of things at risk just in the surgery itself. Yeah, exactly. And with this opioid endemic, it generally starts from acutely requiring narcotic pain medication. Yeah. And just about any surgery, whether it be anything in the abdomen, whether it be ortho, neuro, G, it doesn't matter. Mm Mm-hmm. You, you're going to have incisional pain. You've broken through muscle to get somewhere. You're going to need something hot, right, right. more than Tylenol to get you yep. through it. So even surgery, what being a trauma to the body, re- recovery being hard on the body, it can also contribute to the opiate endemic. Multiple levels to it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you do want to try and avoid surgery if possible. Okay. With that said, again, like with appendicitis, the definitive treatment is to just snip it out. So what's your one recommendation? Let's say, you know, we're doing this, we're doing these cases for the general PA population. So uh, IM, EM, urgent cares, family practice. Whenever a patient comes in with diverticulitis, what are, what are your recommendations? To get a CT scan. That way you can evaluate whether there's any sort of abscess forming, whether there's a, per- a micro perforation or real perforation. It'll just help guide you. So look for the Entry. red flags, essentially. Yeah. And if there are no red flags, then... Antibiotics. Antibiotics refer to GI, mm-hmm. right? If you're in an urgent care clinic or a family practice clinic, 
where they don't have CT scanners or whether it, you did get a CT at an urgent care and it looks concerning to you, don't ever hesitate to send them to the ER. I feel like that's a big step that people kind of shy away from. Yeah, yeah. But you'd rather be labeled as the conservative provider that just keeps sending everyone to the emergency room rather than the one that got fired. <laughs> yeah, or you know the one that realized, crap, this is something I probably should have sent to the ER, and you realized yeah. it a little too late. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's diverticulitis, guys. That was Rachel. Great case. I really liked it. Awesome. I learned a lot. Um, and that will be it. Happy holidays again. I hope you guys enjoy your week, and we'll see you next week, guys. Bye. Take care.